the question uh, whether European law uh, requires national courts to apply rules of European law on their own motion is uh, one that provokes uh, very much uh, emotions. The uh, ever increasing uh, body of European law makes it uh, a very complex uh, question and uh, the technical nature of those European rules makes it even more worryful. Um, moreover, for most uh, national judges, uh, uh, European law is not their first uh, legal system. Uh, it's not their mother uh, legal system. So I think it's fair to say that most judges are less familiar with European law than with their own national legal system. And of course, uh, I think it's uh, well, well, well being understood that this sentiment does not have any legal uh, merit, uh, but nevertheless, one cannot disregard this uh, fact of life. Moreover, the, the question uh, not only provokes uh, anxious emotions, but also raises uh, very uh, fundamental uh, issues relating to the role of a judge in disputes uh, submitted uh, to the courts because it touches upon the division of roles between the parties and the judiciary. Uh, the answer to the question if a national court is obliged to apply European rules at their own motion uh, has a direct impact on the balance struck in national legal systems between all the participants involved in the administration of, uh, of justice. Uh, an ex officio duty of a judge reflects his responsibility for the proper application of the law with surpassing the division of roles in general. And of course, every legal system uh, contains some ex officio obligation for courts but this obligation is all, always a limited one. And the European order, the European legal order in this respect is not uh, fundamentally different. What differs, however, is that the European legal order takes precedence over the national legal order and that European rules should be applied in a uniform manner in all uh, the member states. What, are, what is the impact of these characteristics on an ex officio uh, obligation? But let me first introduce the dilemma with which national courts are faced when they are dealing with the question of ex officio obligation. I uh, take an uh, example from the general case law of the European Court of Justice. The case I would like to mention is the case Doctor C2808. The referring court, the Dutch court, had to decide whether a national decision to slaughter animals suspected of being infected with foot and mouth disease uh, was legal. The cattle breeding holding was suspected of being infected with foot and mouth disease because it was situated in the vicinity of a holding that was found being infected on the basis of a laboratory test. It was being submitted in this case that the laboratory made a mistake. The veterinary authorities, however, claimed that the laboratory test at binding force by virtue of Directive 85.5.11. This question, the question whether a laboratory test could have a binding force, raised a lot of difficult and complicated uh, questions, which were referred to the ECJ. However, a 
only weeks after that national court heard a case in which it decided to refer a question to the ECJ, an almost similar case was brought to the court. However, this case differed in one major respect. None of the parties relied on the invalidity of the laboratory test. The court was aware of the problem because it dealt with a previous case in which it referred questions to the ECJ, but no one of the parties made any issue out of it. So the court was faced with the problem, what to do? Should we only decide on the pleas raised by the parties? And should we run the risk that we will decide this case differently from the other case? Or should we raise in this case, on our own motion, the compatibility of the decision with the directive? In this case, only a European ex officio obligation could be uh, brought any remedy to the claimants. So this case illustrates the problems faced by a national court. It faces the technical nature. It faces the unexpectedness of the problems. Because I think it's fair to say that if the court would not have been confronted with the first case in which it referred questions to the ECJ, the court would not have been aware of the problem. In essence, can the application of European law be dependent on the accidental knowledge of the judge of problems that legal professions might invoke? Let me be clear about the topics I want to deal with in this presentation. Firstly, I would like to say something about the concept of ex officio obligation, because that concept is a rather confusing one. Secondly, I want to raise some related issues. They, those issues that are not really ex officio obligation, but once you talk about ex officio obligation, you immediately think about these other issues. Uh, thirdly, I would like to say a few words about the context, the state aid rules. In the fourth place, I would like to say something about ex officio application in European law in general. And I would like to conclude with a few remarks on the application of the ex officio application on uh, EU state uh, aid rules. To start with the ex officio application, the concept. Um, when we are dealing, when we are discussing the concept of ex officio uh, application by a court, it often appears that although when we, we are using the same words, the meaning attached to those words differ importantly. I borrow from Dutch law the distinction of three types of ex officio application. The first type of ex officio application is the obligation of a court to supplement pleas raised by parties in law. This type of ex officio application is an expression of the principle curia jus novit. The judge, the court, knows the law. The court is familiar with the law and should therefore determine which rules of law are applicable to the submissions of the parties and the court should give an interpretation to those rules. In this first type 
of ex officio application, the court in essence qualifies the pleas raised by parties in legal terms. This legal qualification by the court should, should have a basis in the factual submissions of parties. The second type of ex officio application by the court is already less common. This type relates to an obligation to supplement facts. This type of obligation is based on the idea that the court should base its ruling on the facts as they are in reality and not on the facts as they are viewed and presented by the parties. The factual truth of the dispute should be the foundation of the decision of the court and not the facts as they are perceived or invented by the parties. In this second type of ex officio uh, obligation, the court takes into account facts that are not stated by the parties, parties and verifies facts that are stated by parties but are not challenged by the other party. The third type of ex officio obligation requires that the court rules on pleas on which parties did not rely. The court is in this third type not restricted in considering legal arguments that are not raised by parties. The basic idea behind this third type is that the court ensures the proper application of the law and is thereby not dependent nor restricted by the parties. This distinction between the three types of ex officio application by a national court will be very useful in analyzing the case law of the ECJ, in which often it is not made explicitly what the court meant by ex officio application. These three types of ex officio application have in common that they relate to judicial activism. And as you will realize, the question how much judicial activism is required will not be answered in the same way in every legal system. And even within one legal system, the extent of an ex officio obligation may differ according to the field of law. In the field of civil law, parties will be dominus litis. Parties will have the, the freedom to determine the scope of their relationship and have the freedom to determine which part of their conflict they would like to have to be decided by, by a court. In criminal cases, however, the question might be quite differently. The ex officio obligation may therefore vary from one rule to another. And this is also one of the reasons why the topic ex officio obligation is so difficult to grasp. I would like to say a few words about the related issues. Before I start with those related issues, I would like to make one point very clear. However important the full 
and effective application of the law is, <coughs> and the application of EU law is no exception in this respect, a court is not able to do anything if parties refrain from starting legal procedures or if parties refrain from an appeal against the court. A court decision will always remain dependent on some initiative of the parties. So one has no choice than to accept that there will always be limitations on the full and uniform application of the law and the full and uniform application of EU law. The first related concept I would like to mention, mention is the concept of public policy rules. Usually, the concept comprises fundamental mandatory rules. In many legal systems, the qualification of a rule as a public policy rule implies an obligation for national courts to apply that rule ex officio. The application or non-application of such a rule may not be dependent on the pleas raised by either party to the dispute. However, the expression public policy rule is also used in different contexts. In the Eco-Swiss case, the European Court of Justice had to decide on a request for a preliminary ruling. The question at stake was if an arbitral award that was contrary to European competition rules infringed the public order. If this question was answered affirmative, the arbitral award was contrary to the New York Convention on the recognition and enforcement of arbitral awards. The ECJ indeed ruled that an arbitral award that infringed European competition rules was infringing the public order and could therefore not be enforced in the European Union. Does this judgment seem clear cut only relating to the enforcement of arbitral awards. In later case law, the European Court of Justice caused confusion. In the Manfredi judgment, the ECJ repeated, and now outside the context of arbitration, that Article 101 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union was a matter of public policy. So far, it followed the Eco-Swiss judgment. However, the court continued by ruling on the legal consequence of such a qualification. In this judgment, the ECJ added that national courts should apply competition rules as being a rule of public policy automatically. The ECJ did, however, not elaborate what it meant by automatically application of European competition rules. It did not specify what type of ex officio application it had in mind. However, if I take as a starting point that the qualification of EU competition rules as rules of public order is valid in the national legal order as well as in the European legal order, I get from the case law the impression that the ECJ certainly 
had not type 3 in mind, and most not probably even type 2. Apart, of course, from the arbitration context. If you read the recent judgment of November 14th of this year, in the case British Airways, you will notice that the court explicitly rejects a plea that was not brought in first instance, but only raised in appeal to the ECJ. The ECJ ruled that you cannot raise new arguments in appeal proceedings. This argument could not have been valid if the ECJ considered European competition rules as rules of public order, of type 3. Because if it relates to an ex officio application of type 3, the court will not be dependent on the pleas brought forward by the parties. Can I have some water? The second related uh, concept is the principle of res judicata. A judgment becomes final if no legal remedies are being used or if all legal remedies are exhausted. So even if European law is not being applied correctly. The ECJ recognizes the legal certainty, which justifies the application of this principle as crucial to every legal system. Therefore, the principle of res judicata remains applicable, even if the judgment appears to be contrary to EU law. I refer to the judgment of October 6, 2015, the Tarsia case. However, I have to add, if certain conditions are being met, the state could be held responsible according to the Kepler case law. Not application, but compensation seems to rule. A procedural limitation implying that pleas should be raised before the court that hears the case in first instance is accepted by the court in the Benalol judgment of the 17th March of 2016. The ECJ held that the national rule implying that the point of law that was raised for the first time during the, the appeal procedure is inadmissible is not contrary to EU, EU law. Therefore, the court accepted again, in principle, non-application of EU law. It's the same line of reasoning as the court held in the British Airways judgment I already mentioned. Excuse me. We see a similar line of reasoning in the monocar styling judgment. A judgment of the 16th of July 2009, C 12 of 2008. In this judgment, the ECJ held compatible with EU law a national rule according to which a redundant worker was not allowed to challenge the due observance by an employer to inform and to consult staff representatives within the Workers' Council according to Directive 75.129, relating to collective redundancy. Finally, I would like to mention that the ECJ accepted only a limited obligation to reopen administrative proceedings if decisions that have become final appear to be contrary to EU law. I refer to the Kuhn and Heitz judgment as well to the Biankov judgment.
Now we have some overview of what we are talking when we are dealing with uh, the ex officio obligation of uh, the law. And it's time to, to turn to the provisions that uh, interest us in this context, the state aid rules. I can be very brief about those rules. The role of national courts with regard to state aid is a relatively limited one. Only Article 108, Paragraph 3 is directly applicable. And of course, the question might arise when we are dealing with decisions taken by the Commission. In many cases, at least uh, relating tax cases, uh, there is no real interest in relying on Article 108, Paragraph 3. Those who are liable to pay tax cannot rely on the argument that the fiscal measure enjoyed by another business constitutes state aid in order to avoid payment themselves of the tax. So taxpayers themselves only have limited interest in raising the question. In ordinary state aid cases, the argument that a certain measure constitutes state aid, which is incompatible with the treaty, is raised by competitors. However, competitors are not participating in tax procedures. So, the last party we have are the public authorities. However, a tax inspector is part of the government, so it's a bit awkward that he has any interest in claiming that the state aid measure, a measure by the state of which he himself forms part, is illegal. However, in specific uh, cases, this might be different. Um, the case I would like to mention uh, with specific interest is the, and it's Spanish, so I don't know if I pronounce it correctly, uh, the Congregación de Escuelas Pias Provincia Betania, which proves a fine example where there is some interest. Spain negotiated with uh, the Roman uh, Catholic Church an international agreement by which the church was exempted from taxes. After this treaty had been concluded, a new tax was being introduced um, in Spain, a tax on the introductions of applications for building permits. According to the Spanish Constitutional Court, the tax exemption in the agreement with the Holy See also was applicable to this uh, tax on the application for building permits. A school operated by the church applied for a building permit to enlarge the assembly hall. The school started legal proceedings because it claimed that the levy of the construction tax was contrary to the agreement between Spain and the Holy See. And the defense by the municipality was that the non-imposition of the building tax was contrary to Article 1083. I will not deal with the substantive uh, issue of, those, of this case, which were also very interesting. But it's just a demonstration that under specific conditions, even in tax cases, 
the state aid argument might arise. There is one intriguing question, however. Does European law allow that a state relies on its own wrongdoing to strip private parties of rights vis-à-vis -vis the state? To strip them of rights to which they are entitled under national law? In other words, is the state allowed to argue that because the state did not comply with its European law obligations, in this case the non-notification of state aid, to prevent that private parties are able to claim what they are entitled to. In the context of Article 108.3, this question has never been put forward to the European Court of Justice. However, there are some judgments uh, which might indicate that the Court uh, of Justice is under certain conditions opposed to a state that relies on its own wrongdoings to strip private uh, parties of benefits they are entitled to under national law. So it's worth noting that this question is still open for debate. So, in state aid cases, uh, the most common type of cases, there are no parties that have an interest in the enforcement of uh, Article 108.3. Does this make the state aid case very specific? <coughs> I don't think so. And I would like to mention the judgment Heemskerk and Schau. This judgment relates the export of calls to Morocco. <coughs> the export of Heemskerk and Schaap consisted of 600 calls. Together with 40 calls of another company, they were transported on an Irish motor ship. Heemskerk and Schaap claimed export refunds. They claimed, but the export refunds were denied because the authorities hold that the costs were not transported in a way to prevent undue suffering. The capacity of the vessel for the transport of cattle had been exceeded by more than 100 head of cattle. After administrative review, the authority responsible for the grant of export refunds decided to uh, grant refunds for the cattle that complied with the capacity of the ship. So refunds were uh, refused for 111 cars. Heemskerk and Schaap appealed from this decision and claimed export refunds for the 640 cars. The National Court analyzed the decision and the applicable law and took the view that not only with regard to the excess cattle, but with regard to all the cattle, export refunds had to be denied because not only 111 calves were not being transported under conditions to avoid undue suffering, but all the calves transported by the ships were not transported under such conditions. However, none of the parties had any interest in submitting this plea. Heemskerk and Schaap not, because they wanted more. The authorities not, because they awarded uh, uh, refunds for a number of uh, costs. So only an ex officio obligation of the national court could solve this problem. Does European law oblige national courts to apply European law in this case 
on their own motion. The ECJ answered this question negative. There is no obligation, not even in this specific circumstances, to apply European law ex officio. Legal certainty and legitimate expectations are opposed to it. So, even limited interests of parties to rely on a correct interpretation, application of European law, does not call for a specific special treatment. The fundamental question, does European law to be applied by national courts more rigorous than national law? Is European law so special that it should be treated differently from national law systems? For an affirmative answer, there could be some uh, support found in the case law. I mentioned those judgments on the slides. If these judgments were to be interpreted that European law should be applied ex officio, it will be an obligation that applies to all provisions of European law, because these judgments are founded on the very nature of European law. Moreover, if these judgments are to be interpreted as an ex officio obligation, it should apply to the European Court of Justice as well, because it relates to the nature of European law. I would not advocate such an interpretation. In my view, nothing in these judgments indicates a procedural obligation for national courts to apply European law on their own motion. It is a substantive obligation. European law takes, from a substantive point of view, precedence over national law. Basically, procedural rules are not harmonized in the European Union. So, European law has to be applied according to national procedural law. It implies the obligation of the uh, power for national, uh, for, for member states to designate tribunals that have jurisdiction, they are obliged to do so, and it implies the right to lay down the procedural rules that covers the actions for safeguarding rights that individuals derive from European law. There are two important limits, the non-discrimination rule and the effectiveness rules. Of course, there are some uh, specific rules in which the procedural rules are being harmonized. For instance, Article 2 of Regulation 1, 2003, relating to the application of European competition rule, and Article 2 uh, provides some provisions on the burden of proof. It's important to note that ex officio application is not precluded by European uh, law. The case Verholen, the judgment is already an old one, but a very clear one. It relates to the principle of equal treatment of men and women in matters of social security. Uh, there was a general old age pension payable from the age of 65. But the man whose spouse was resident and dependent received an increased pension. <coughs> However, if the spouse had exercised an occupation abroad, the increase was reduced in proportion to the number of years the spouse worked abroad. This is clear-cut uh, discrimination, 
but it was not raised by the parties. Does European law preclude from assessing on its own motion where the national rules are in conformity with the directive? The Court of Justice said no. However, there is a restriction if national law applies for the ex officio application of European law, it should be done in conformity with the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Law. This was being ruled in the Judgment Online Games Handels GmbH. So, if you are according to national law, allowed to raise pleas of your own motion, you should give European law the same treatment. The first case in which the Court of Justice ruled that national procedural rules remain applicable is the Van Schendel case. The parties did not raise an argument that a certain agreement was contrary to the European competition rules. They only did so in appeal for cassation. In appeal for cassation, it was according to national law, not allowed to raise new pleas. The ambit of the dispute submitted to the court was limited. Were parties allowed to rely, contrary to the national procedure rules, on the application of European competition rules? The court ruled that there is no obligation to apply the European competition rules if that is according to national law not possible. The condition of effectiveness, the limitation on the procedural autonomy, does not require an ex officio application. Recently, the court ruled in the Farkas case on a similar issue. The national court in that case raised the incompatibility of national rules with the VIT directive on its own motion. The court started again to stress the principle of procedural autonomy. And it continued to say that the principle of effectiveness does not, as a rule, require a national court to raise on its own motion an issue concerning the breach of provisions of European law. Only such an obligation exists in exceptional cases where the public interest requires <laughs> intervention. However, the court did not specify when such specific exceptional conditions were at stake. In the case, the judgment Peterbroek, we see a de facto ex officio application of European law. The case will related to the application of a tax rate that was higher for companies having a seat abroad than for companies established in Belgium. The police had not been raised in a complaint procedures, and if they were not raised in the complaint procedure, they should be raised in the appeal document that should be lodged within 60 days. Under these circumstances, the court ruled that a rule that prevents a court from considering on its own motion 
whether a measure of domestic law is incompatible with EU law when the latter provision has not been invoked is contrary to European law. The court applied the principle of effectiveness. So by applying the principle of effectiveness, you may have you may obtain the result that there is an ex officio application. We already discussed the substantive issue in the doctor case, the case relating to foot and mouth disease. Again, the court ruled that EU, EU law does not entail a general obligation to apply European law, even if the parties do not raise an EU law plea. The ex officio application is a matter of procedural autonomy. So we learn from this judgment that it does not really matter if you are dealing with civil law cases or administrative law cases. What type of ex officio application did the ECJ have in mind when it ruled in the case doctor? I think it was type three. It did not relate to the qualification of pleas raised by parties. It did not relate to the ex officio establishment of facts, but it, re it relates to the ex officio raising of European law claims. So no obligation of type three ex officio application. There is a specific field of ex officio application. It relates to consumer law. Directive 93.13, the inferred terms in uh, consumer contracts. The ex officio application can follow from the need to assure the effet utile, the useful effect of a directive. And this effet utile is the decisive factor in judgments relating to consumer law. The Oceano judgment illustrates how the Court of Justice concluded to an ex officio application when it comes to the application of this directive for national courts. The case concerned the purchase of an encyclopedia on installments. And the purchaser did not pay the sums due on the agreed date. The seller claimed that these uh, amounts, claimed these amounts in a legal procedure brought to the court of Barcelona. The contract between the seller and the purchaser uh, conferred jurisdiction on this court. Such a clause is, according to an annex to the directive, unfair. However, none of the defendants relied on this directive. So none of the defendants claimed that this clause that conferred jurisdiction on the court of Barcelona was unfair. Basically, because none of them appeared in court. The court ruled that there were several elements in the directive, which call for a uh, proactive uh, action by the national courts. The court referred to the weak position of the consumer vis-à-vis -vis the supplier and the seller. It called for the re-establishment of the equality between the consumer and the seller. And it uh, 
considered that positive action unconnected to the actual parties to the contract was necessary to restore the balance. So the court founded the obligation to apply provisions of this directive ex officio on the choices underlying the directive. This type of ex officio obligation is type 3 of the ex officio application. The national court is obliged to raise on its own motion without being dependent on the parties pleas of law. The content of the ex officio obligation in this type of cases not only is limited to type 3, but also calls for type 2. The court should supplement the facts that are necessary to decide the case on its own motion. What does the ECJ do itself? Which provisions or in what under which conditions the European Court of Justice applies European law itself on its own motion? If you have a look at the procedure for a preliminary ruling, it's easy to recognize that the court will not answer questions that are not being put forward by the referring court. The court is not allowed to establish facts in such a case, but the court qualifies the questions by referring courts in legal terms and even corrects questions that are phrased on wrong legal terms. So in the procedure for a preliminary ruling, we can see, we can under, discover a type one uh, ex officio application the qualification of the questions in legal terms. If we have to look at the procedure for annulment of decisions by European institutions, we will see that the Court of Justice, and I mentioned just one uh, judgment, only looks ex officio at the legal faults that can be discovered from the decision itself. So if you discover by reading the discussion decision only that there are some flaws in it, then the court will uh, exercise ex officio control. The court will not accept any further pleas ex officio. Ex officio application in European state aid rules. There is no clear ruling at this time. The Finanzamt Linz can be seen as a judgment in which the referring court applied uh, European law ex officio because the plea was only raised in the appeal procedures, but the Court of Justice did not answer the questions relating to the state aid uh, provisions. A negative indication can be found in the Markman judgment. It's an old one. Uh, it relates to the German grant, uh, grants of, uh, to investments in certain uh, regions. And uh, uh, in this case, uh, um, the court uh, stated that it's to the uh, internal legal system of every member state to determine uh, which uh, legal procedure uh, should, be, uh, should be applied. The question by the referring court was if every individual could directly uh, rely on uh, the incompatibility of state aid 
or that there should be a specific procedural rule, specific procedure in the German law. The court, however, uh, uh, bluntly refers the question to the national procedural autonomy. The case Commission versus Ireland uh, is also an interesting one. Uh, it's an appeal procedure and it relates to the exemption uh, of excise duty for minerals, uh, mineral oils that are used uh, for the production of uh, alumina in the Shannon region. So it's a very limited uh, state aid scheme. The Commission initiated the, the procedure provided for in Article 107, Paragraph 2, and took a recovery decision. And only in defense, the Irish government uh, uh, submitted that uh, the measure itself uh, was not attributable to, to the state. And the court uh, uh, considered that a plea going to the substantive legality of a decision which falls within the scope of infringement of the treaty or any rule relating to their application within the meaning of Article 263 can be in contrast only be examined if it is raised by the applicant. So any substantive illegality will not be uh, will not be uh, judged by the court ex officio. It's a direct case, so it's difficult, uh, it's, it's, it's not very clear if it also relates to national courts, but if the uh, character of the provisions itself uh, is decisive, it can be applied also in national uh, courts. Ex officio uh, application uh, the public order uh, avenue. Uh, we have seen Eco Swiss, we have seen Manfredi, in which the court ruled that it related to fundamental provisions that are essential for the functioning of the internal market and therefore should be qualified as rules of public order. The same uh, 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 line of reasoning can be found in the consumer directive uh, case law. Again, the Court of Justice did not really uh, specify what it meant with public order. We have public order in the context of arbitration, uh, but uh, only there we have seen that the Court accepts uh, any uh, obligation. In the field of competition law, rules that are qualified according to this case law uh, as public order, the Court only seems to accept uh, a type one uh, obligation. Deterrence also can be an argument, but it, it applies to most provisions of the European Law Treaty. The question whether a national court is obliged to apply state aid rules ex officio might be of little importance, because there are numerous ways to redress a situation in which a national court did not apply uh, state aid rules. I briefly refer to the uh, Locchini uh, uh, judgment, where uh, national authorities uh, granted aid for the modernization of certain uh, steel uh, plants. Uh, they notified uh, the aid to the commission, uh, but the procedure uh, uh, did not went on very speedily. So Lucchini applied to a national court uh, to get uh, uh, to get uh, the disbursement of uh, of the money, and it was awarded to this the disbursement. Uh, the, in appeal, the Kansas judgment was dismissed, and then the commission took a decision uh, in which it uh, 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 took a recovery decision. The competent Italian authorities took a new decision and during the uh, legal procedures they were phrased uh, with the uh, plea that uh, this was contrary to the res judicata principle. The court stated that under these conditions 
uh, you could not rely on the principle of res judicata, because only the Commission is allowed to rule on the compatibility of state aid with the treaty. And while the uh, Commission in this case ruled on the compatibility of state aid with the treaty, or better to say the incompatibility of the state aid, uh, uh, that decision should be applied by a national court. In essence, it relates to a uh, matter of uh, competence of national courts and the Commission. Um, other alternative is that the judgment of the national court itself can be qualified as a state aid measure, as has been done by uh, the European Court of Justice in the recent DEY uh, judgment. And of course, even if the national court uh, decided or did not decide on the applicability of the state aid rules, the Commission can always take a decision. So the question of the ex officio application of state aid rules might be a rather trivial one. 